All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Michael Cartucci. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, although I suspect it's not very near and dear to anybody else's heart. And I don't know exactly why that is. I don't know if it's that people don't like writing sequel or they don't like working with the people who write sequel. And I say that with all the love in the world and as a former DBA. And I'm going to tell you all my story here in a moment, but uh, I know people don't like the DBAs. I think they like the DBAs less than they like the databases. And I say that, you know, you know what DBA stands for, right? Don't bother asking. <laughs> it's one thing I've learned, that was it. Uh, but I'm going to talk about this topic. It's not a popular topic. It's not a very interesting topic for a lot of folks. It's something that we try not to think about. And with the way that technology has gone, we don't have to think about it very much at all anymore. And I think I have a slide somewhere about in here. But um, we don't have to think about this much at all anymore because we've got tools like Hibernate. We've got ORMs. We can abstract all of this away. Nobody's building DALs anymore. And it's a really good time to be alive if you don't like writing SQL, except uh, none of this is really going away. You know, we got promised 10 years ago. Do you remember MongoDB came out? NoSQL came out. And uh, that's, that's all we needed because NoSQL had shards, and shards, if you'll remember, are the secret sauce that, that, that makes the web scale. And uh, suddenly everybody put everything to MongoDB, and then they found out, oh, this didn't work really well at all, and they started putting everything back into MySQL. This is the 2019 Stack Overflow uh, Developer Survey, and right up top, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, SQLite, uh, getting the overwhelming developer share and mind share of what people are using and what people are working with. So even though we don't think about these things anymore, they're not really going away. And for my purposes, I've written a number of uh, SQL talks for different conferences, for general tech conferences. I think if I went to something like Pass, I'd get a lot of attendance. But going to something like UberConf, UberConf, there's almost 1,000 attendees. I had two in my database talk. And I thought it was objectively a good database talk. And I've tried pitching again and again and again, and I realized that just nobody really cares about the database. So what I want to do here is give you a little bit of insight, talk about some things that will be of value to you, whether you want to interact with the database or not, because inevitably you're going to have to. And, um, and for me, databases were something that I was always really drawn to. Years and years ago, I was a VB6 developer way, way, way back in the day, back when I was working for, for Martin. And that, that, that's the technology that we worked with. That was the language, VB6. And I'm looking around the room, and uh, okay, we got, yeah, a couple of people remember this. VB6, wasn't it a wonderful language? One of my favorite language features was the on error resume next directive. <laughs> Exactly. I, I don't know how people do today. On error resume next. For those who don't know, for the young people in the room, on error resume next is basically you telling the compiler, eh, it's visual basic. How bad could it be? Just keep going. Just, just ignore it. Just keep going. Yeah, it, it eats all exceptions. Yeah, right. it eats all exceptions. And uh, what a wonderful language. Now, VB6, which is very, very different from Visual Basic.net, which is actually OO, uh, VB6 is not. VB6, there's a lot to not like about it. Uh, but that's what I worked with, and that's what I learned on. And I liked it because it was really easy for me as a teenager to get into trouble. I remember being in, in high school, I would write programs that looked exactly like the login screen <laughs> of the computers at school. I knew everybody's password, by the way. It was great. I literally knew everybody's passwords. I had four or five domain administrator credentials. I, I had everything I needed. And it was just, it was a good time. And by the way, <laughs> knowing what people's passwords are is like a window into the soul. Uh, I knew who the popular guys were. Five different women in my class had Eric as their password. <laughs> Nobody had Michael. <laughs> And that one still hurts. But I was, you know, I was VB through and through, and then I got this job as a VB developer. And to be honest, as bad as the language was, I got pretty good at it. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, unfortunately, it was at the end of its life. Microsoft was all in on .NET, 
and uh, VB6 got officially retired. And it was about that time that I was moving back to the U.S. That, uh, that I met somebody and I decided impulsively in my early 20s that the right thing to do was to up sticks, move back to America, and get married to somebody I'd met just a few months prior. Right? That always works out, getting married in your 20s impulsively. That's, always, that's good advice. If anybody's listening, that's what you should do. <laughs> They're laughing because you shouldn't. And uh, I did this. And I, uh, by the way, it didn't work out. If, I don't want to spoil it for you, but... Uh, it didn't work out, but I, I flew over here and I, and I moved, and I, I checked everything, I brought everything I owned as checked luggage on that flight, and I get over here and I start looking for a job, and it's the worst possible time to be looking for a job because uh, everybody had pretty much moved to C Sharp, except for uh, those handful of shops that decided that, you know, we like our VB, we're going to keep running our VB, and a couple of them are still running their VB. This was, this was 15, 16 years ago. They're still running their Visual Basic, and uh, I knew that that would be a career dead end, and it seemed like the only alternative would be to either take a step down and get a junior .NET developer job, which I really didn't want to do, or I could bluff my way into, uh, there's a better word for this, misdirect, I don't know. But I could lie my way into a more, more mid-level .NET developer position. And I just, you know, I've got a little bit of ethical flexibility, but I just couldn't do that. And it was a really, it was a, it was a really rough situation that I'd placed myself in. And I realized one day that what I'm really good at, aside from VB, is specifically SQL Server. This was the database DBMS that we were working with at the time. Uh, my last job, and I said, uh, I said, you know, everywhere I've always worked, I've always been kind of the, the SQL SME, the subject matter expert, so maybe it's too bad I can't just get a SQL job. It's too bad that's not a thing. And I just typed it in for funsies and the dice, and it turns out there's about 25, 30 open SQL developer positions in the, uh, the greater Denver area, and I got one in Boulder. I was a SQL developer at a company that was doing some really complex stuff at a at a really alarmingly large scale for the time. I mean, now I think this is nothing. But at the time, uh, they were dealing with financial data. And it was something like oh, just over 1.2 billion, uh, very data-heavy, real-time analytics, very complex page views per week. Uh, at their peak, their load was huge. And it was the perfect environment for me to forge my SQL skills. And I worked there for quite a while until I got completely burned out on SQL and I realized that uh, I needed to diversify my skill set. And I started looking again and I changed my entire tactic. I started looking for .NET developer, full stack developer type jobs. By the way, don't hold the .NET thing against me. You know, I was coming out of the Microsoft stack and I didn't know where else to go. I hadn't found my home yet. And um, I applied for a few jobs and I said, you know, Here's the problem. I'm really deep with SQL, but I'm only so-so with, with C Sharp. And they said, that's perfect, because we've got a bunch of developers that are really deep with C, C Sharp, and they're not even so-so with SQL Server. So you'll fit right in. You're going to balance the team right out. And that gave me an opportunity to broaden my skill set. But working for that company uh, was great for me, because it was an environment where every little detail mattered. Every millisecond mattered, and it behooved every single one of us. And there were about 60 or 70 SQL developers in that company. Uh, it was necessary for every single one of us to find, uh, to dive into the internals, to dive into the minutia, and really truly understand these things. And these skills have translated over to MySQL, to Postgres. I've done a little bit of Oracle, and, um, and it's served me well ever since. And I've talked to a lot of developers, and... Uh, one colleague of mine who I worked with very, very near to this office, actually, which is a little bit surreal for me. I felt like I was driving to work for the first time in years uh, when I was coming up here. And he says, you know, what there ought to be is a just enough SQL series that, to, to give us just enough we need to know. And, uh, and that we can move forward with that. And that's kind of the vision of this talk, to give you just enough information and insight to be able to do anything you want to do, be able to make good decisions without having to become a database expert or anything like that. And, uh, you know, we're not going to have to deal with a lot of this stuff 
too much anymore at all because we do have ORMs, we do have these tools that will generate our SQL for us and generate our queries. But more often than not, if you're going to run into a bottleneck in your application, it's going to be in the database. And if you're going to effectively deal with that bottleneck, then you're going to have to sidestep the ORM and write a little bit of uh, write a little bit of SQL, just like in the old days, we used to write a little bit of assembly language when you really needed to tune something and hone it. Now, of course, I love, I love SQL. I used to try to do everything in SQL. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was to try to do everything in SQL. Turns out, you pretty much can. We had a requirement once to write a, a uh, URL encode function. And me being the SQL guy, I said, I bet I could write that as a uh, inline table valued functional function. In other words, I wrote a URL encode function that was a single select statement. And it scaled really well, by the way, just in case we ever needed to, 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 to URL encode four gigabytes of, of oh wait, no, uh, 4,000 bytes of Unicode, sorry. And, uh, and that was my idea. I thought, uh, okay, well, if you need to URL encode something in your, in your UI, you should make a database call. And I was so proud of this code that uh, I posted it online. It's still out there. And uh, it's got like 5,000 downloads. This is how I know I'm going to developer hell. <laughs> because I put that out there. And there's a bunch of other really bad out things that I put out there. Uh, but I, I do still love SQL. I have, I have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for it. But uh, for those who are wondering, and I overheard some conversation early on, uh, we're not actually going to talk about the language at all, because SQL is a fairly simple language. It's not too hard to get. What's difficult to get is the paradigm behind it, because we're coming from uh, declarative languages, or sorry, imperative languages, or I'm using these terms wrong. I'm absolutely certain of it. Uh, but basically, most of the time, as developers, when we write code, we're telling the computer what to do. And with SQL, what we're really doing is we're describing the shape of a result set that we're going to get back. And just that little switch is usually pretty difficult for developers to, to kind of mentally change gears. And this is one of the reasons, this is that impedance mismatch that so many people talked about. It's one of the reasons that we don't like working with SQL and we avoid it at all costs, even if it means putting everything into MongoDB or CouchDB or Cassandra or whatever the current hot thing is. Um, so for me, we're not going to talk about the language itself. Uh, I want to talk at a, at, a, at a slightly higher level. I want to talk about five core concepts. And if you understand these, even at a fundamental level, you're going to be head and shoulders above everybody else, all of your peers, that uh, you'll know how to make the right decisions in any given situation. So the five things we're going to talk about are five essential uh, SQL skills have nothing to do with select star from or inner join or cross join or cross apply or any of these things. It's indexing, join operators and the algorithms behind them. Uh, logical database design, query optimization, and finally thinking in terms of sets. Uh, now all of these are extremely valuable. Starting at the beginning, indexing. Uh, to really understand indexing, you've got to understand the physical storage of the data on the disk. You've got to understand how this is organized. And really, the way this works, your tables and your indexes, everything is stored as a B tree. In other words, you've got a root level, you've got decision nodes, and you've got your leaf nodes where all your data resides. And what's in those leaf nodes varies slightly depending on you know, if it's a primary index or a secondary index. But the whole idea here is that it, it's, it's the optimum data structure for a lot of the things that we need to do. We need to be able to seek down to a certain value. And your leaf nodes, in most cases, are also doubly linked lists. So all of your tables and your indexes are organized in this way. So when we talk about indexes, because really the way I like to think about this is these are pretty much always indexes. Uh, if you've got this B tree structure, it's always one type of index. It's either a primary index or a secondary index. Or if you're using SQL Server or some other databases, the parlance is a clustered index or a non-clustered index. But they both essentially mean the same things. Uh, and these are the only two real types of indexes in a relational database that you're ever really going to deal with. Uh, I'm going to leave some of the unstructured data and XML indexes and things like that out of scope for this particular talk. 
uh, but we'll talk about both of these, starting with the primary index. The primary index, well, a lot of times we think about that as the key and the key that we're indexing, but ultimately the primary index is your entire table. And what it's, what it's essentially doing is it's building that data structure again, but it's also physically ordering your data in the, on, in the table. You're physically ordering all the data in the table into the, into the pages, into the leaf notes. The example that I like to use is a phone book. Phone book is a perfect example of a primary index because the key is last name, first name, or looking at this particular example, it's last name, first name, because uh, we've got uh, Timothy P and Timothy P. It's, it's last name, first name, and then address. But all the data that's in the phone book is on the page, but it's physically ordered by the key, which in this case is a composite key of last name, first name, address. So that's what's defining the physical order. So if we look at the B tree, this all makes pretty good sense. Uh, that your, your decision nodes identify which pages you could seek to. So you can seek very quickly to pretty much any piece of data in the, in the database. Now, depending on what DBMS you're using, your data pages are going to be 8K or 16K. If you're using MySQL, InnoDB by default sets a page size of 16K. SQL Server, I think, is still an 8K page size. But this is really how all of the data is organized. And the key that you use for a primary index or the clustered index is important because that becomes a pointer to every single row. That is how you uniquely identify every single row in the table. And you use that regardless of whether or not your primary index is a unique index or not. Because you can create a non-unique clustered index on a table. A lot of people typically will just by default, by rule of thumb, by habit, create table my table. And the first column is going to be int id identity primary key clustered or some variation of that syntax. And that's what we tend to use. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is why people do that, why that can be beneficial and why sometimes that's not beneficial. And then that will give you the insight that the next time you create a table, you're going to know exactly what to uh, index that on, what, you're gonna, what to use, the primary, key, primary index, the secondary index. And you don't even have to use the primary key as the primary index. It doesn't have to be unique. It's just defining the order of the data on the page. So the question you might be asking, I doubt it, but you might be asking, well, how can this be a, a, uh, a unique identifier for every row in the, data, in the table if it's not unique? Well, the database engine is actually going to append a four-byte unifier. To that, uh, to that key if it's a non-unique key. That way, every single instance of that key will also have that unifier. But that's an important thing to know as well. When you're, when you're creating an index, if you're creating a non-unique primary index on a table, then you're going to get four bytes of overhead for every row in every index. And again, these don't seem that important right now and at the surface, but as we dive in, you'll see how these things can radically affect performance, especially as you start to scale. So the one thing about primary indexes, and I apologize, my references don't get any more current, is that there can be only one. And uh, there's not enough people who are around in the 80s in this particular <laughs> talk. You know what, I thought, uh, it's okay. And, and none of my references are current, to be honest. I, uh, I gave a talk a few weeks ago, and it was in Seattle, and it was a group of young people. And I, I was talking about this notion of functional fixedness. I don't know if you're familiar with this term or not, but basically it's a, it's a problem-solving obstacle. It's a mental block where you look at an object and you only see its intended usage and not all the other ways you can use this thing. And uh, so I said the poster child using the word child loosely, for this would actually be MacGyver. Because he'll look around the room and he'll see that trash can, he'll say, oh, I can make a telephone out of that. And I just see a trash can. So I put this up there and I said, uh, you want to be like this guy, not this guy. I mean, if you want to. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop you. I'm not gonna keep you from your dreams. But I, it was MacGyver. I said, you want to be like MacGyver? And I got met with a room full of blank stares. And finally I said, y'all know who MacGyver is, right? And then I said, look, raise your hand if you've never actually watched an episode of MacGyver. And one person up front said, what's a MacGyver? 
And that just made me sad. I just died a little on the inside. But there can only be one because your primary index is your table. Now, what we mainly think about when we think about indexes are secondary indexes or non-clustered indexes. And the way they work, they contain the index key, which is whatever you're indexing on, and then they have a pointer back to the primary index. So if you've got a unique primary index or unique clustered index, that's going to be your clustered key. So it's going to contain both values. That's structured as a B tree as well. And uh, I think I already said the, the, the leaf nodes are essentially doubly linked lists. So the idea, if we were, and I apologize in advance, uh, when I was thinking about examples, I thought, I know, I'll use cards. Because for some reason, if I'm the kind of person who's going to do our URL encode in the database, I'm also the type of person who's going to put all of my cards in a table. If this is our primary index, right? We have our card ID, which is just a surrogate key, a monotonically increasing integer. We have a value, and we have a suit, and stupid Excel embedded in PowerPoint is formatting that like a number and that like a letter, and I'm hoping you won't hold that against me. Then if we wanted to create an index on value, right now with this, everything is ordered by this card ID because this is the primary, uh, this is the key of the primary index, and these are the other values that come along for the ride. Um, I would have to scan every single row in the table in order to find that in order to find that, uh, that value. And we'll get to that in a second. So what our index would look like if we wanted to index on value is we, is we, would, we would have two things in that index. The key that we're searching on and the card ID. This is the pointer back to the primary index. That way we can go to the index, we can seek directly to the value that we want. Maybe it's this right align 2 that's going to drive me crazy. And then that's going to give us a pointer, 41. So 41 is the row in the table that we're going to look up to. So it's a seek in the secondary index and it's a seek in the primary index. Now, one of the things that drives a lot of developers nuts is they understand this. They more or less understand how indexes work. They make things faster, right? So they put the index in there, and then they run it, and it's still slow. And so finally they go and they do an explain or a show plan or whatever tool their database gives them. And it says, okay, we're going to do a simple. The table's called DEC. We're going to do a range search. I could use this key. This is a key I could use, but the key I do use is none of them. I'm just going to do a scan. And it's really important to understand why that happens. And the reason is the optimizer is going to look at the cost of accessing the data in different ways. And this is a really key concept to grasp as well. Because if you look at this as I'm telling the database what to do, then not only are you going to run into problems, you're going to create some just hassle for yourself, but you have to realize that it's not about telling the database what to do, it's about telling it what you want in return. And so if you tell it what to do and you force it to do what you want it to do, then ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to do exactly what you said and you, you lose the possibility of any kind of optimization. Whereas here, you just say, I want to select these values from this table given this criteria. And the optimizer is going to say, okay, well, let's look at the possible ways we could do it. I could use the index, and uh, we're just going to give it an arbitrary unit of work. Well, we're going to seek to the first index value. That's going to be one cost. Now we're going to seek to the, that position in the primary index. Now we've got two. And then I'm going to seek to the third value in the position, and the fifth value, and so on, and so on, and so on, until we get to the nth value and the nth position. And those seeks, those individual seeks, start to add up. All key lookups in the primary index start to add up. And then it looks at the cost of scanning the entire table, and it's going to say, well, this is only going to cost eight. This is going to cost as many as there are values to look up. And so normally, the query optimizer is going to make the right decision. It's only guessing. It's guessing based on statistical sampling of the data, that it can look at the data and, and make a pretty good estimated guess of how many lookups it's going to take, how much memory it needs. And all of this becomes important a little later on as well. But one of the reasons the query optimizer won't select your index is because the cost of doing these lookups can be higher than the cost of just doing a single table scan. So that's a good thing to keep in mind as well, because, if, because the reality is, 
indexes need to be uh, need to be deliberately created. They're going to give you value, but at a cost. And over, after a while, the cost is going to add up and add up and add up. This is why we can't just index every single column. I mean, in a lot of cases we can, but we definitely shouldn't. And we'll see why that is here in a little bit as well. So one trick, if you want to get some benefit, if you want to sidestep this optimization and say to the query optimizer, no, you're going to use my index that I created because I'm the developer and you're the computer, is you can create something called a composite index, or sorry, a covering index. And a covering index is also technically a composite index, but there is an important distinction. When you create just a composite index, usually you're interested in indexing all of the different fields you're specifying as part of that composite index. If you're creating a covering index, you're really just saying, I want to index this, and I want these values to come along for the ride. And the reason is, then it can seek, if all you want is value and suit, it can seek the value in the index, and it can also satisfy, it can satisfy all of the output for the query just from the index without having to do a lookup. Now, there are a couple key distinctions between a covering index and a composite index, and the, and the specifically how this gets implemented is going to vary from database to database. But normally, for example, in SQL Server, if you're creating a covering index, what you're doing is you create an index and you specify the key, and then there's an option to add columns under this sort of includes section. So create index, IXN, whatever, on column, 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 uh, includes other column, other column, other column. And that tells it that you're including those values into the index. So now you essentially have this, uh, uh, this automatically maintained denormalized index view, essentially, that you can satisfy an entire query, query with. But it knows that the includes columns aren't going to be indexed. They're not going to be sorted. And that means a couple things. One, primarily, that the includes columns aren't going to be included in the decision nodes, in the intermediary nodes of the B tree. So you get a little more compact performance there. But it also knows that if you update a value that's included but not part of the index, it's not going to have to go and reorganize your index. And that's going to save you some overhead as well. Now, not Every DBMS explicitly supports covering indexes, but that doesn't mean you can't create them as composite indexes. Just understand that some of the overhead that you're going to get. And the key thing is here, even though our, our covering index includes card ID because every secondary index contains a pointer back to the primary index, I, I had this grayed out. I said, we don't even need this because if everything, if all the columns specified in the index definition will satisfy the output, then there's no reason for the query optimizer to go look up, look up, look up, look up, look up. But like I said, updates to the table require updates to the index. Moving something is going, moving, uh, moving rows around the index creates a lot of overhead, creates a lot of I.O. The big three of index overhead which is what you have to balance in all of this, is index maintenance, when page splits happen, and when you get page fragmentation. So the way a page split, what, the way a page split basically breaks down, remember, a leaf node, a page in SQL Server, for example, is 8K. In MySQL, using InnoDB, it's 16K, which means that's the maximum amount of data that you, have to, you can put in that page. Now, that data gets allocated whether it's full or empty. A uh, page is always a page, so reading one page, in MySQL is always 16K of I.O. And it's going to put that data into memory in 16K blocks. Again, whether the page is full of data, whether there's this much, whether there's that much, whether there's almost nothing in there at all. But let's assume for the moment that you've got a well-optimized, defragmented table. So everything's full. Everything is, is using the exact 16K available to you or 8K or whatever it is that you get with your database. And then we insert a row. OK. We insert the row into the primary index. Now, as part of that insert, even though we've written that data, now we've got to update all of the indexes as well. So we find all the indexes. And then for everything that we need to update, we need to target the specific leaf node for that index to insert that into so it can be in the right position in the data structure. 
and now it's got to allocate space on there and if it's because if we if this page is already full there's nowhere to put it so imagine this if you were to uh, imagine it like this if you were an old-fashioned typesetter and you typeset the entire phone book and you just finished out every single one of these plates and then right before it goes to the press the product owner comes up and say oh by the way one more thing uh, we've got four more uh, people just moved in so we're gonna add them at the last second it should only take a minute to add one more row to the phone book right and no you've got to retype set a bunch of things now in reality you're not gonna re lay out every single plate that would be insane and it works the exact same way in the database you're not gonna re reallocate every single page you take one page you take half of the data and you put that into a new page and then you can insert that where you are so the the downside of this is now your insert has another 4k of IO or more taking half of that page and putting that somewhere else. And the other downside is that now your pages start to become fragmented because originally they're all nice and sequential on your disk and then you stop and I'm going to take some of this data and the only open spot is over here. So now as you're seeking through the database, it's, it, it's doing a nice, nice sequential read. It's like, okay, here we go, here we go, here, oh, okay, over here, okay over here now we don't have to worry about this too much because uh, for the most part random IO was not that that expensive on solid-state drives but if you have any kind of magnetic media again that starts to matter especially at a high scale and high transaction rates so you can see how this page split you're basically you've got half empty pages now so so even though you're doing the same amount of IO you have to do more to read the same amount of data and uh, you've got page fragmentation because pages get allocated wherever there's space for it and there's this cost every time you do an insert you end up page splitting so things that you can specify when you're creating an index or things like your fill factor where you can say okay by default I want you to only fill my pages X amount so you've got a little bit of wiggle room but these are important things to at least understand the key thing is the more you optimize in one direction, you're de-optimizing in the other direction. In other words, if you add a bunch of indexes, your reads are gonna get a lot faster at the cost of slowing down your writes. So it's always about finding that balance. And that's kind of the key thing to understand with indexes. Basically, you need to, you should know not just the entities and the attributes and what the data looks like, but ultimately how you're going to be accessing that data. A couple other quick tips before we move on. Always index the most selective field first. Basically, you want the first value that it, that it, that it looks up in the index to, to narrow it down the most. So if you have an index just to pick something at random on uh, first name, last name, telephone number, right? You want to index on all three of these. The best way to organize that is by telephone number, which is only going to, which is, which is going to be a lot more selective than first name. Turns out there's a lot of Michaels out there, and it's going to be more selective than last name. So that's just kind of a key thing to think about. Another one is to adopt an index naming convention. This is a pretty valuable thing as well because developers usually they'll come in and they'll say, I don't know, my query is going really throw, going really slow. I'm going to create an index, and they go and create an index, and they use whatever tool they have, and it's just going to create an index called. Uh, index one, index two, index three, whatever. And nobody spends any time to actually go and look at what's already there, especially if they don't mean anything. But if we all use the same index naming convention, then you can never create duplicate indexes. Because again, remember, the query optimizer is going to go and look at all the indexes and all the different ways to access your data. And if you have a bunch of duplicate indexes, it's still going to go and say, okay, what if I use this index? Hmm, what if I use this index? Hmm, so you're adding overhead. And I've seen situations where a database has been so poorly designed that the query optimizer actually times out. And it says, you know, all right, that's the best one so far. We're just gonna go with this. And a lot of cases, the query plan that it generates is, is unbelievably inefficient. Uh, it's just a good habit to get into. Uh, another really key one, now that you understand how this data is structured, you understand why it's important to keep your indexes as narrow as possible. Because if you're doing all of your I.O. in page-sized reads, then ideally you want to get the maximum amount of data out 
of the end out per read. So if you've got one row that fits in a page, then, then you're going to have to allocate a whole lot more space in memory. You're going to have to do a whole lot more I.O. And I.O. is the single biggest and most expensive thing in the database. Whereas if you can keep your indexes very, very narrow, the performance of all of this just gets faster and faster and faster. The I.O goes way down and, the, and the, the performance goes way up. And so this means don't index things that you don't necessarily need to index. Uh, if you've got really long fields, consider indexing a subset of the data or hashing the data. That was a good guess. I couldn't remember what the next slide was, but I thought, I bet it's creating hash indexes. And this is something that, that I do a lot. Um, in fact, I've got a, I've got a um, database table right now that contains email data. Basically, an email comes in, and I have, I have about oh, 8 million email messages that are in this table right now. And so it's got from, to, subject, body, et cetera. And uh, what I want to do, though, is I want to keep all of this unique. So every time I'm going to write an email into the database, I want to make sure we don't already have this in here. So one, I could write a query, say select star from, right? Because that's what we do. It's great advice, right? No, don't, seriously. Select star from is a paddling. Um, <laughs> but I'd select from my table uh, where body equals x, subject equals y, date sent equals z, right? That would be a ridiculously inefficient query just to do the I.O., especially since, think about this, if my database page, if, if the page in my structure is 8K. Have you ever gotten an email where the body of the email is longer than 8K? All of us. So where does that go? That goes into lob storage, large object storage. And so that's out of the page. And so now you have an absolute huge amount of I.O. if I'm trying to, to write a criteria on that. And a lot of the older large string uh, data types can't even be indexed. Like if you use the old text data type instead of like a, a varchar max or a varchar, I don't know, I've heard it both ways. Is there a consensus? Varchar, is that? Varchar, okay. <laughs> okay, let's try something simple. Tabs or spaces? Yeah, I don't know. I, s I, I don't even know why I ask. I guess I want to acknowledge to at least half of you that I know I'm saying it wrong. Sometimes I go back and forth, so I'll say SQL or SQL, and uh, I go back and forth on that just because I know there are people out there who have strong opinions about this. Uh, but, I mean, honestly, I really don't care. Like, I've known the correct pronunciation of GIF for I don't know, 20 years. I'm still going to say GIF because I've been saying GIF that way forever. And it turns out I'd far rather be happy than right. So use prefix indexes on a long string or use a hash index. So that's what I have. I have a column in my database, which is just a hash of all these fields that I want to uh, that I want to search on. And then I just create a hash of that. I've got that hash. I put an index on that. That's going to be a whole lot narrower than all those other fields. And I can very, very quickly look that up. And that's going to be a very narrow, very compact index. It's going to perform really well. Um, you know, one more thing before we wrap up, just to uh, keep things going. I want to give you an idea of a, of a, uh, a scan versus a seek. And you're right here, so you're, you, get, you get the job. Does that sound good? All right. Well, you can also participate, but uh, I'm going to lay these out. Um, By the way, just out of curiosity, how many people have ever come to my memory talk? One, two, three, four. Okay. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say probably not. Can anybody still do pi to 50 places? If you thought about it, maybe? That's one of the things I teach in that. So for a while, I, uh, I did a, uh, a memory talk, not memory optimization, but memory optimization. And uh, one of my favorite stunts to do was to memorize a deck of playing cards. <coughs> to 
to give you some context, 1, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So 52 is here. 25 would be 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Does that make sense? So without this, right now, if I were to name a card, you'd have to go and scan every single one of these until you found it. What the secondary index would allow you to do is to seek directly to it. So imagine these are uh, your, your data pages, your leaf nodes in the B tree. Sound good? Sound good? Okay. Right, I think I got it. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Somebody name a card. Three of clubs. The three of clubs is the fourth card in the deck, number four. Is it four? Yep. Okay, somebody name another card. Seven. Yep. Somebody give me a number between one and 52. 36. 36 is the jack of clubs. Somebody give me a poker hand. Anything. Full house, what full of what? Kings. So kings full of what? Deuces. Kings full of deuces. All right, we'll do the kings first. The first king in the deck is the king of clubs, that's 18. The second king is the king of diamonds, that's 26. The third king is the king of spades, that's 31. Correct so far? Let's do the deuces. The first deuce is the two of hearts. That's number two. The second deuce is the two of spades, and that's number ten. All right. So you can see how much more efficient that is, right? Uh, being able to instantly seek to whatever you wanted to seek to. All right. That's the end of that. Um, and thank you, by the way. It's not easy. It was like a minute to memorize a shuffled deck of cards. All right, second one, join operators. Uh, now that you understand this, how, how the data is going to be structured in the table, it's good to understand the join operators as well. Has this just stopped working? Let me try unplugging and plugging it back in again. Is the TV just yeah, off? The TV turned off this time time. last time. Too. Oh, really? Time's out or something? Uh, oh, here's this. There we go. Oh, let's watch Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting bored of sequel. <laughs> you didn't talk very much about natural indexes versus artificial ones. Uh, Why natural ones aren't really recommended? Well, I'm going to get that on the database design section because yeah. that's, that's an important thing as well. So we'll get to that. Um, but I just want to talk about indexes in, in isolation. All right, join operators, number two. Now, when you think of join operators, usually you think of the logical join operators. Inner join, left outer join, right outer join, a full join, a cross join, uh, a semi join maybe, even though that's more, that's kind of a special case more than anything else. Uh, I assume you all know what these all are. Um, you've probably never written a full join. You're unlikely to have written a right outer join. In fact, I rarely do. It's easier for me conceptually to reorganize my right joins and the left joins. Uh, cross joins, I think we've all made one of those accidentally. <laughs> yes, okay, good. And that's where, back in the old days, the old syntax where you would say select from table A, comma, table B, comma, table C, and your join criteria would be in the where clause. Instead of saying inner join table B on A dot ID equals B dot AID, right? In the old days, you would just specify a list of tables and then you'd implement your join logic in the where. And if you forgot to do that, you'd run your query and you'd say, why is this taking so long? And then it finally comes back and says, why did this return 10 billion rows? Oh, because <laughs> you get the Cartesian product. Now, these are pretty simple to, conceptually pretty simple to understand. I'm not even going to insult you by trying to explain them to you. Uh, what I think is more important to understand are the physical join operators, how, what, basically what the algorithms under the hood that the database uses. Because again, when you understand this, you can optimize any join. 
nested loop joins, merge joins, and hash joins. Uh, there are other names for these. I think SQL, uh, MySQL calls a merge join a key ordered scan or something like that. But we'll go through those one at a time. A nested loop join is pretty much exactly what you would create if I gave you a pen and a whiteboard and I said, write a join operator. R join this set to that set. You say, okay, for every row in set one, find all the matches. Great. Now we get the next one. Find all the matches. Great. Next one. Find all the matches. So you have an outer loop and an inner loop. And the semi-join comes in, if you're curious about that, the semi-join comes in in a special case where you're writing a join but you're writing a join not because you actually want all of the data joined out of it but you want to simply test the existence of another record in that set. You're testing for set inclusion or set exclusion and what the optimizer says, we usually people write this as a left join. You'll say select from table A, left outer join table B on key whatever criteria, right? where table b.id is null. Now the query optimizer will look at that query and say, oh, you don't really want to join, you want a semi-join. It says what you're really saying is where not exists or where exists or where in or where not in. And so it adds this special case. As soon as it finds one match, it returns. So it's, uh, it's a heuristic, it's, a, it's an optimization, it's an early out for that special case. Uh, so that's a pretty simple join to understand. And you can understand the amount of I.O. it takes depending on the size of the sets. And the query optimizer, of course, will figure out uh, the optimum, where the optimum place to put the inner loop and the outer loop. Now a merge join or a key ordered scan is a more interesting join operator because it's dramatically more efficient from an I.O. perspective. Because assuming that both sets are in the same order, you make a single pass through both sets. So if this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I can say, okay, outer table, inner table, find me all the A's, great, cool, that's the last one, find me all the B's, great, that's the last one, find me all the C's, find me all the D's, so it makes a single pass through. So, so imagine the efficiency of that versus this. So the only way to get the query optimizer to select this join is for both data sets to be in, order, in the same order, to be already sorted in that way. And there's all kinds of tricks that we used to do in, uh, where we would try to um, uh, force the database to uh, do some kind of intermediate materialization. And one of the biggest tricks in SQL Server back in the day was you would write a subquery and you would write select top 100% table where order by and you would treat that as a derived table. And people would look at that and say, why would you say select top 100%? Isn't that the same as saying select blah? Well, yes, but with the top and the order by, it will actually do the sort before and, and, and basically sort that derived table before you do anything else with it. And then the query optimizer team figured out, oh, that's what you're doing. We're going to stop that. The query optimizer now is going to ignore select top 100%. And so I would just go in there and say select top and then I would just put in max int because basically I don't ever think I have more than max int uh, uh, rows in any particular table that I'm working in. And that would work, so 2.1 billion or whatever, and then it would still work because you gave it a specific number. And uh, where this becomes more relevant though today is particularly important if you ever have a query that you're trying to optimize, and so you deconstruct the query and maybe write and maybe perform your intermediate materialization by writing everything into a temporary table. And now it makes sense to say, oh, well, I want to I want to create a primary index on this temp table on this key and now when I do the second phase of the query it's going to choose a merge join over a loop join. Now if you think a, a loop join costs more than a merge join you're right but what costs dramatically more than all of them is a hash join and a hash join is kind of a special case that you get when the query optimizer doesn't have any indexes to use and the data sets are sufficiently large that doing just 
uh, linear scans over and over and over again are prohibitively expensive. So what it does is it builds an index on the fly in the form of a hash table. So it's going to take one table, go through, and uh, hash every value that you're joining on, put all of those into a hash table. And the second table, is going, it's going to use that to probe. So it's going to get a value, hash it, probe the hash table, probe the hash table. So once a hash table's built, it's actually relatively efficient. Hash table lookups are extremely fast, as we all know. Uh, the cost of building a hash table, especially a large hash table, can be kind of expensive. But the other cool things about hash joins is that they parallelize really well. They parallelize better than any of the other uh, join operators because it's really easy to divide up hashing and probing. I could say, well, look, we have this hash table here. I'm just going to give you this set of data. I'm going to give you this set of data. I'm going to give you that set of data. Go have at it threads. And when you're building, you just have one and you're, you're hash partitioning the data with a really fast hash. Okay, that goes to you, that goes to you, that goes to you. And that works really well. So you do get parallelization. The downside, of course, is if you don't have good indexes, it's very possible that you don't have good statistics. And so what the query optimizer has to do is estimate how big this hash table needs to be. And you can get into, into uh, memory usage issues where you, ha you build this hash table, but it's gotten so big that you need some of that memory back. And so then it has to take ha some of that hash table and flush it to a disk. And then this way you can spin up some other part of the hash table and probe it here. But imagine you've got 20, 30 threads all probing this hash table. And every time you want to probe your hash table, it's going to have to flush my section to disk. And every time I want to probe, it's going to flush your section to disk. You're going to get into thrash mode really, really quickly. So that's something that you want to watch out for. And in general, hash joins you want to avoid because it's, uh, it's a smell. It's not necessarily a smoking gun, but it's a smell that uh, you've got missing indexes or that there are other s design issues that you're running into. All right, number three, database design. This is where we get into things like natural or surrogate keys and, and everything else. I'm not going to insult you and bore you by talking about normal form. Uh, you know, I was a database expert for a really long time and I was applying for a job once and they started quizzing me on all the different levels of normal form. And I remember one of them, somebody says, what's, uh, what's seventh normal form? <laughs> the one that's never used. <laughs> the one that means you need to denormalize a little bit. <laughs> I've gotten asked some really bad interview questions in my life. I think the worst one was I was asked in an interview for a web developer job, what are the seven layers of the OSI model in order? <laughs> And I didn't know, uh, by the way, because I only had to know that one time. It was for one test in school, and it was an open book test. You know why? Because it wasn't that important. Anyway, there's a myth, and I, the, only, the only thing about normalization that I really want to talk about is this. Normalization is not the solution to a problem that doesn't exist anymore. That's what the NoSQL people were, were crying out from the, from the rafters 10 years ago. They're, they said, you know, normalization is stupid, joins are bad, just serialize it all into objects and throw it in the database. Throw it into your, your, to your document store, throw it in the MongoDB or whatever. And they said, the only reason we have joins is because in the 1970s, disks were expensive. So it's partially true, and every good, every good uh, lie does have a nugget of truth. Disks, disks were expensive in the 1970s. I, uh, I found one once, and it blew my mind how big and how expensive and how slow a 5 megabyte disk was from the 70s. And uh, so sure, that's an issue. But the real issue is a lot of data is inherently related. And this is what people found out when they moved wholesale over to MongoDB. They're like, oh, I can't put this value in every single record because when I change it, it means I have to change it in every single record. And then the 10-gen then the people say, oh, oh, well, you can link documents. And, uh, and oh, okay. And then you start linking documents, and, I, and you find out that that's a really terrible idea. Um, basically, if you're linking documents in an object database, it means you're using the wrong database. And I'm just going to say that. I hate making blanket statements, but I'm going to make that as a blanket statement. But the reality is... 
Uh, the biggest benefits of normalization is to avoid redundancy and avoid logical inconsistencies. It also actually re requires you to think through your database model. I have a, I have a MongoDB talk, because for all of my trashing on MongoDB and kind of making fun of it and everything else, I use it. I use it in production. And uh, I use it for specific purposes. And it works really well for those specific purposes. And I give a talk on MongoDB. And uh, the thing that really bums everybody out when I give that talk is that I spend a lot of time talking about document design. Because the whole big selling point was you don't need to think about it. It's schemaless. Just throw it in there. Yeah, and then you have 28 different versions of a document, and then you have all of this code that's trying to figure out which version it is, and all of this conditionals. Well, if it's this, and if it has that property, but not that property, if this is an object instead of a string, and it turns into a giant mess. So I, basically, I've, I tell people that you have to spend as much time thinking about document design as you have to think about table design. And as soon as you're linking the documents, it's time to move that data into a relational data store. But that's a rant for a different day. Key things, choose your data types wisely. Narrow columns are better than uh, wider columns. This is, these are the things we don't normally think about. You know, if you create a string in a, in a database. Well, first of all, if your average developer is creating a string in a database, what they're probably doing is they're defining a string property in a POJO, and then they're telling their ORM to go and generate tables for them. And it says, uh, with, no, with no metadata on that string at all, it's going to create the biggest, widest string data type possible. And then later on, your, um, and I'm going to talk about this on a different slide, but later on, the query optimizer is going to say, well, every single row in this, every single field in this column can be up to 5 gigs. So I have no idea how much memory to allocate. I'm just going to guess. Uh, so if you can specify lengths, that's good. Narrow columns are usually better. The null thing, I've done a lot of benchmarks on this. I don't avoid nulls. Uh, I, I think null is actually a valid value. So I don't go out of my way to avoid nulls or put some stupid placeholder value in instead of a null. This is something a lot of people say. This is something that's in my slide deck. So people don't understand that's where they get lost. So let me, let me tell you what, this is, this is where uh, like regular Java developers or C-sharp developers, this is, this is where they get really confused. They'll say where x, where x equals y or where this equals null and they get nothing back. And they say, what the heck? Because that's null, that's null, that's null. Every single, every single row has this column, this column is null. So why is it not returning anything? Uh, because in the database world, According to the ANSI specification, null literally means unknown. So, I've got a box, I don't know what's in it. I've got another box, I don't know what's in it. Are those boxes the same? Don't know. I don't know. So, the logical result of null equals null is null. In other words, unknown, is, is this unknown the same as that unknown? That's unknown. Uh, so, that really throws people off. So, in the database, you say, is null is not null. Where column is null, where column is not null. Now what you can do is most databases allow you to turn off the ANSI behavior of nulls. Do that at your peril. <laughs> but yeah, most people don't understand nulls. I would teach that during database class and I would have three somewhat experienced database developers suddenly die for their phone. <laughs> <laughs> My worst thing as a, as a, as a DBA was um, we had one team and they wrote, I think the fifth worst thing ever written. And it was, uh, they implemented machine learning in SQL. And they implemented it, and that's now, by the way, you can't really do this with SQL as a language. The language is not adequately sophisticated to do this. So they basically wrote uh, metacode. 
So the C we had SQL that would generate 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 SQL. Um, it was impossibly bad, and it was impossible to debug. In fact, uh, every time you run a query, one of the things that the query optimizer will do is it will take your query, it will hash the exact text of your query, and it will look in a hash table for a saved query plan. Because have, has, has the, basically, the query optimizer says, have I gotten this query before? And if the answer is yes, it doesn't have to do, it doesn't have to compile a query plan. It can just use one that it already used. Well, here's one I made earlier. Now, with the dynamic SQL and the metacode and everything like that, every single SQL statement that was run by that server was different, was material different, materially different. This is another reason, why, by the way, why you should parameterize your SQL. Not because, not just for security, but also for plan reuse, so you don't have to compile every single statement over and over and over again. And um, because every single SQL statement was materially different, and by the way, these are, these, th because they're hashes, that means if there's any difference, any binary difference, if it's one more space, if it's a capital versus a lowercase, it's a different hash, it's a, it's a vastly different hash, uh, it's not going to reuse the plan. And so the query plan cache got so big that it was taking over a minute just to check and see if there was a plan already in the cache because it had to flush 90% of the plan cache to the disk. And as a DDA, one of the things that I'm never ever going to forgive myself for, I wrote a job that every 15 minutes would clear the, the query, the, the proc cache, and, uh, which was something I never thought I would have to do. But I digress. Uh, avoid nulls where possible. I think null is a valid, valid answer. Like if I don't know what your phone number is, should I put an empty space? Or should I say, I don't know what your phone number is? Because your phone number is not empty space, is it? Because if it is, that'd be super difficult to dial. <laughs> um, so I think there are plenty of cases where nulls make sense. I think query optimizers have gotten smart enough. This is still banded about, and I pulled this from somewhere. So, I don't know, take that with a grain of salt. Simple is always better than complex data types, though. That's a key one. Uh, that's a key one. Like, um, uh, I was working somewhere restoring IP addresses in the database, and we wanted to index those and look those up really, really quickly. And um, so we were storing them as strings. And that makes it really difficult to do, uh, to, to build compact indexes, and it, and it made it really difficult to do a couple of things that we wanted to do. But it turns out that your IPv4 address is really just for octets, right? And that lends itself to a much more simple data type that's going to be a lot more compact. Now, again, all of these things have to be done deliberately. Uh, telephone number, it's a number. So why store it as a string when you can store it as a number? Well, your phone number is a number, except in in until you start getting international numbers, and now plus four four. Or um, if you want to structure the phone number. Or my personal favorite, I worked for a startup, and uh, we'd licensed the entire Dun & Bradstreet database. And we'd basically just uh, written a script that would go and suck all of their data out and put it in our database. Now, this wasn't technically what we were supposed to do, but that's what we did. And then I started using it. I started, because uh, my, my, my side hustle, back in those days, I was still a working magician. And I thought, you know, I was going to go buy a mailing list of corporations to cold call for corporate gigs. I have that database. So I get down there on my lunch break, and I, my, my goal is to make 10 cold calls every break. And I get down, and, I, and I've searched through the database, and I got my little list, and I call. And it's like, oh, how about that? The number's disconnected. And then I call the next one. It says, huh, how about that? The number's disconnected. And I call the next one. I say, huh, how about that? The number's disconnected. And then I realize <coughs> that every single call was the same number. Specifically, it was, it was all in the 214 uh, area code. And specifically, uh, it was, let's see, because I can't remember this off the top of my head. Come on. Uh, it was 214-748-3647. Hmm? 
Yep. So they were storing phone numbers as a four byte signed integer. And the vast majority of the phone numbers were 214 748 3647. And I told somebody about that, and they said, oh, wow, it's disconnected? I should get that number. That'd be a killer geek vanity, vanity phone number. <laughs> I said, as long as you don't mind 100,000 wrong numbers a day, it sounds great. <laughs> so try to simplify. Again, remember, narrow is better for your database performance, for your index performance, for your index size, for your I.O., all of this. Uh, the other one is way Car versus Varkar, Char versus Varchar, way this versus that, however you want to pronounce it. Because uh, remember, remember how the, the query optimizer, well, there's two pieces. The query optimizer has to guess how much memory it needs based on the width of the column. And if it's a variable width column, then it's going to average that out. And uh, it might be right, it might be wrong. And you're going to run into, you, you're going to potentially run into memory issues there. Uh, the benefit of the cars is always going to be a fixed width, and it always knows how much memory to allocate. And the other benefit is if you update that column, it's not going to have to move any data around. Let's say you've got a, because uh, remember, imagine you've got a page full of data, and I go and insert, I go and update a value and make it slightly longer, and now you're overflowing the page because it has to allocate new space in that variable length field. So it's one of those things to weigh. What are you going to get a better, better benefit from? Is it the, uh, the compactness of the variable width column? Or is it the consistency and the, the never having to page split from a fixed width column, where that, that amount of space is always allocated? Uh, one thing, beware auto-generated schema. We talked about that already. You want to specify, your, uh, you want to specify all of your metadata. So it's going to generate good schema, not just lowest common denominator schema. And I apparently don't have a slide here for what you were talking about. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, one of the things that we almost always do when we create a table, and I mentioned this earlier, is create table, my table, first column, int, identity, uh, auto number, whatever it is, primary key, clustered. And so our primary key is on this identity, on this auto number column. And it's our primary index. Based on what we've talked about so far, what are the benefits of this? This is, this is the interactive part. So this is where I at least wake everybody up. Insert your insert narrow, sure. So which means that all of your secondary indexes are going to be narrower too because you have to have the primary, the, the, the primary index key, the clustered key, in every single index. So that's a benefit. It's automatically unique. You don't have to worry about uh, you don't have to worry about that. Also, if you're making your primary key, it never changes, because one thing I always tell people is your primary key should never, ever, 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 ever change, ever, except never. Never you never change your primary key, and if it's generated, it's never going to change. What about page splits? What happens if I create 50 new records? they're all going to allocate at the end and into new pages and the new pages. So they're going to sequentially fill the data pages. You're not going to be trying to insert them in random places like if you were using a GUID as a surrogate key. So you don't want those to change. Um, now, there's an argument among database purists, and there's a lot of database purists are very fond of arguments. Uh, database purists don't usually work in the real world. They usually work in academia. And uh, so they're primarily academics. And the problem with people who are primarily academics, I found, is they aren't interested in what works in practice until they've proven it works in theory. So one of the things they'll do is they'll say, no, you shouldn't use surrogate keys. The key, the whole key, and nothing but the key is your data. OK, what should I use? Well, some natural value that uniquely identifies the individual, such as email address. <laughs> I share an email address with my wife, and sometimes I change my email address. Is that going to be a problem with your schema? Oh. Social security number. My favorite. <laughs> cool. They never change. Right. <laughs> no one ever and, uses it. And, yeah, yeah. They just never do 
Except, then you get your first customer from overseas. Social security number. Um, but no, they actually do duplicate social security numbers. They do change as many people have discovered. Mm -hmm. But then you've got a whole bunch of people who don't have social security numbers at all. So the first one, they get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Cool. No, it gets, re gets rejected from my software. Oh, really? I send tax information in. Guess what, what? One of the things we look for, social security numbers that are all zeros or all nines. Oh, really? Oh, so, so IRS requires it. Now, um, <laughs> you know what I, what I like doing is uh, uh, I, I read an article once. It was an interview with a woman whose name is Jennifer Null. <laughs> <laughs> and she says that literally nothing works for her. <laughs> I always want to, you know, now with all the web developers, I actually want to start entering my name in as object, comma, object. And just, just to see it, just to mess with the, with the developers. <coughs> Bobby, hmm? Bobby Tables, yeah. <laughs> Bobby Delete all things, yeah. Drop all tables. That used to uh, that used to that used to get me every now and again. I, I you know I was I built my built my application when I was when I was a junior junior developer, uh, back when I was a better magician than coder. Uh, who am I trying to kid? I've never been a good coder. Those who can't do teach right. That's a joke. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> um, no, I, I I would build I wrote my application and. Uh, and then, like one of the people, first people who got put into the system, his name was O'Reilly, and uh, and it broke the application. I'm just like, can you just take the apostrophe out of there? <laughs> and uh, that was my solution. Anyway, oh good, it came back. Anyway, all right, we got one, we got two more things to talk about. How are we for time? I don't even know. What time am I supposed to finish? When you're done. Okay, cool. All right, in that case, <laughs> let's do the 25 essential so SQL skills. <laughs> I got nowhere to be tonight. All right, query optimization. Actually, it starts getting pretty quick from here. Query optimization. Actually, I have no idea because I don't have my, my little slide counter here at all. So who knows? I'm only complaining. Uh, query optimization. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, really simple rules. Don't ask for more than you need. So you can use top or limit. Um, don't fetch all the tables from a multi-column join if you don't need them. So you can specify that in there. Don't fetch more rows than are needed. Uh, don't, uh, well, I said select star from, that's a paddling. Do I have that in there? No, I don't. Dang, that's, you know, because that was a good meme for a while, the old uh, Jasper when he became a teacher. You remember this from The Simpsons? The teachers went on strike, I think, and they brought in people from the community to become teachers, and, and Jasper, the old man, Grandpa Simpson's friend, he just stands at the front of the room, and he's holding like a cricket bat, and he's going through the rules of the class. He says, uh, making fun of my shoes, that's a paddling. Talking out of turn, that's a paddling. Making fun of the paddle, oh, you better believe that's a paddling. <laughs> so I used to have a, 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 little, a little printout that turned into a meme for a short while, and I had to print out my cube that was, uh, select star from, that's a paddling. I need to just have it in there. It, it really loses a lot when you just try to explain the joke. That's why I don't do comedy. I do magic instead. Uh, if there's one thing I learned, if you're explaining, you're losing. And I, I, I seem to do a lot of explaining of my humor. That's, that's why I do magic and not comedy. Uh, learn where to find bottlenecks. Uh, fortunately, every tool, every database has a lot of tools available to you. Uh, so whatever you're using, get familiar with what the, the capabilities are. Like MySQL has a slow query log. That's actually a tremendously useful tool, not by itself because it just dumps out a huge um, meaningless log, but they also give you a log parser called MySQL dump slow. Uh, they are usually DMVs. Uh, they are usually kind of queries and, and, and schema data, metadata that the database keeps that you can query out to find queries that don't use indexes, indexes that don't get used. These are just useful things to know. Um, What's the DMV? Oh, dynamic management view is what it, stand, what it stands for. Uh, I, don't, I don't think every database has them right now, uh, but it was, it was a very, uh, very valuable feature for me in SQL Server. To, uh, there were a bunch of SQL DMVs that would tell you, you could query out uh, index usage statistics, you can get basically it just it, it allowed you to query um, 
a lot of different log data that would be valuable to you. And it would present it in a lot of really useful ways. So I had queries that I could run on my database as a DBA where I could say, okay, show me all the indexes that aren't currently used. Show me all the queries that don't use an index. Show me, um, and you wouldn't just get that information, you would get cost association and how frequently that thing is called because all of this forms part of this. Now, I guess what I'm really getting at though for you is maybe this is starting to get a little bit deep, but what becomes valuable at the very least is if you have general performance problems, being able, knowing where to look at the logs, knowing how to read a query plan, all of these things become valuable. Uh, when you look at a, you know, it, it, it would be worth learning how to read a qu query plan for whatever database you use. And I'm not really going to talk about that specifically because the reality is it's, it's going to be different for every, every, every database. But learn what the access methods mean, learn what it means when you have different available keys and the utilized keys. That's a valuable thing because one of the key things, one of the, the core reasons you're ever going to dive into the database and you're ever going to write any SQL manually is in response to a performance problem. And this is why if you, this is why I consider being able to read a query plan one of the essential skills. Because there's a problem, there's a bottleneck, go and fix it. If you don't even know where to start looking, look in the logs. Look in whatever tools you have available to you. Uh, if you have a query that you need to make faster, learn how to read a query plan. These, both of these things I consider to be crucial skills for that reason. You don't have to go to DBA level depths. And if you didn't want to, I wouldn't blame you because I wouldn't advise emulating a DBA in any way, in any, in any sense. By the way, reminds me of the uh, best SQL joke I know. A DBA walks into a NoSQL bar. He can't find a table, so he leaves. <laughs> that unfortunately reminds me of the worst SQL joke that I know. A, clear, a query walks into a bar, selects two tables, and says, do you mind if I join you? <laughs> that one usually gets the groans. And they don't get any better, I promise. So. Uh, one key thing, essential skill around query optimization, and I, I heard this term coined years ago, sargable, search argument, because um, there's always more than one way to do it. So if you're going to optimize the query, uh, you need to be able to, do, you know, you need to know which is the optimum way. So here is a question that I answered in Stack Overflow. Somebody asked a question, how do you test if something is older than three months? I've been having some trouble to select the rows of my table, which has a date of three months prior of today. I should have edited it. I tried using date now minus interval three month in my where clause, but no luck. How do I, how do, I do this? There were two answers presented. One of them is mine. Uh, and a spoiler, mine was the right one. In my opinion. No, objectively, it's the right one. So, which of these, because these are two different ways to, uh, to satisfy that query, they get the exact same result, which one is more optimum? And uh, this is where you throw out an answer, and remember, if you guess wrong, we are all judging. You're going to say bottom, you're going to say bottom. Does anybody say top? Rabel, you're going to say top, you're going to say top. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, two for top. How many for bottom? How many for, uh, I don't care, I just came here for the pizza. <laughs> okay. And the card tricks. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad the card tricks got more hands in the pizza. That actually warms my heart. Okay. And the answer is, boom. The bottom one. Sorry, Matt. But here's why. For, for those who don't know or don't care, uh, this date add mm minus three minus three get date is going to evaluate one time. This is going to return a constant. And now we have a constant that we can plug into the predicate. And if there's an index on manufactured date, then we can seek directly to the start of that range. Whereas each value each, each instance of manufactured date in every single row is now a parameter to the date diff function, 
which means that this method, this function, has to evaluate for every single row in the table. So the optimizer can construct a search argument out of this, whereas here it has to scan the entire table every single time uh, with, the, with the upper one. So, and in true, true to my word, Rabel, I'm judging you. <laughs> Consider yourself judged. In fact, you know better. I have to turn my back on you, I'm afraid. I hope you've learned your lesson. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, one thing that's valuable to do to optimize a query, sometimes it just makes sense to restructure a query. There's a lot of different ways that you can decompose these. Sometimes you can just take a, a result out in your application and then send it back in. Sometimes what I typically do to decompose a query is I'll write part of the query into a temp table and then I'll do a second part on that. And the nice thing about temp tables is they can be indexed, they can be, they can be physically ordered by whatever key you want to specify. Uh, you get a lot of benefits of uh, working in temp tables. Sometimes it's just too much if you've got a very complex query. Sometimes the best way to optimize it is to deconstruct it and break it into stages. And if you can read a query plan, then it becomes very easy to figure out exactly where to start to break it up. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about, just to bring it full circle, to bring it home, is changing the way that you think. Because to be honest, SQL as a language, like I'll say it again, SQL is an easy language. The paradigm can be difficult if you haven't really spent any time thinking about it. The reality is when you're dealing with data, you're dealing with sets of data and you're manipulating sets of data and you are reshaping sets of data. So you have to think about it, you know, what they call kind of set thinking or, uh, there's, is there another term for this? Set theory. Set, well, set theory, discrete mathematics. I mean, you can go to it from that perspective too. But I don't want to get too overly academic. Like I knew one database developer who uh, actually minored in discrete mathematics and was very fond of set theory and, and would basically like whiteboard out everything in like set theory notation, and, uh, which is fine, except nobody else really understood that. And, and he knew that, and that's why he did it. <laughs> hey, everybody. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. We've got you know, this union, you know, intersect you. And oh, oh, did I lose you? Oh, you don't understand discrete mathematics? Really? Oh. Well, let me dumb it down for you. I used to do that too. It's, you know, it's, uh, I think we've all been guilty of that at least one time. Write some really like, like terse code. You're like, oh, what's the matter? You don't understand my smart person's code? <laughs> oh. It was bad. I was a Perl developer for a very short while. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I, I loved doing everything in one line. Anyway, set thinking. Um, the key thing is to understand the query optimizer. I've talked a little bit about this, but the key thing is the purpose of SQL as a language is to describe the result you want back. Not what you want the database to do, you're describing the result you want back. The purpose of the optimizer is to describe the most efficient way, or to determine the most efficient way to execute a query. So if you, if you bring in imperative style programming, essentially you're preventing the optimizer from doing its job. So you need to break that mindset. And that's the hardest thing for a lot of developers to break because we've been doing it this imperative way forever. And um, so one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten or that I've ever, I've ever heard was stop thinking about what you want to do to a row. Start thinking about what you want to do to a column. And that is seemingly simple but that is absolutely the first step to change the way that you mentally approach this stuff. Instead of thinking, okay, I want to go to each row and do this, this, and this, and then go to the next row and do this, this, and this, I want to take this column and apply this transform on it. I want to take this column and apply that transform on it. And if you can do the first step, then you can avoid the grossly inefficient row by agonizing row data processing. Um, so uh, when I worked in Boulder, we were a SQL Server-based shop, and SQL Server 
uh, has the capacity to do cursors, to use cursors to just iterate through a result set and perform an operation on it. Our rule was very simple. Only DBAs get to use cursors. And um, because it's too easy to fall back onto that as a crutch. Well, I want to loop through this, because this is what we would do in any other programming language. We get everything into a, uh, a list of objects, and then we're going to iterate through it. And, or we'd write some kind of functional expression. So the, the, the way that we deal with this in SQL is a little bit different. And as long as you understand that, you're going to, you're going to write dramatically more efficient SQL. And I know none of us ever want to touch the database, but when you do, you're going to make a lot of really good decisions. Thank you. And the key thing is, honestly, as long as you understand a couple fun, when I think back over my career, uh, the, most, uh, most, the most important things I've learned weren't any syntax tricks or, uh, or anything with the language itself. It's once I understood a couple key concepts around the internals, everything else just fell into place and that I could always make good decisions. So hopefully you never have to touch the database, but when you do, you now are head and shoulders above the vast majority of the developer community. So, congratulations. Mike. Thank you, Michael. Now, how about a round of applause for Mike and the organizers, everybody? Because it's really weird to keep my applause, or take my applause and then keep talking. And then it just creates this weird applause void, so now the applause belongs to you. Mike. All right, so now we got four things to give away. One's Ticket. Ooh. Will you be talking on this there? I don't know. I'll tell you what. I'll, let's find out. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's look at the schedule. I know I'm doing a full day workshop on Vue, apparently. Um, so am I still tethering? Apparently I am. My battery's not dead yet. Hooray. Uberconf.com. By the way, does anybody not know what Uberconf is at this point? You can be honest. One, two, three, four, okay, five. Uh, is anybody erroneously thinking it has something to do with the ride-sharing company? <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, hmm? Aren't they talking? I don't know. I, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to speculate about that. Um, so, UberConf, I'm going to give you the 30-second the, the backstory. Jay Zimmerman, the founder of No Fluff, Just Stuff, was originally an organ, one of the, the organizer and head of the Boulder Java Users Group. And uh, the, the problem that Jay discovered was it's really hard to get good speakers. And it was every single time, it was, a, it was a struggle to get people up to Boulder to talk on any topic. And he realized, you know, what I should just do is I should just organize a conference. And uh, that way I could bring a bunch of speakers in and have a great, ha have a great learning experience. And basically kind of take the philosophy of a jug where, you know, it's a very vendor light or vendor vendor free zone it's all about the content it's all about the community and he put this conference together and other jugs around the country said hey that's really cool do you want to do one of these in our city and thus the no fluff just stuff tour was born and and it started going to 10 then 15 then 20 25 cities around the country all over the place and doing that over and over and over again for several years for about eight years Jay was doing this and finally uh, all the attendees consistently said, hey, this conference was great, but we want more. We want more than two days or three days. We want more than just, you know, four tracks or five tracks. We want to dive deep. And, uh, and so Jay, in true Jay fashion, said, oh, well, you, you, you want to you wanna go bigger? We'll go bigger. And thus, UberConf was born. Before the rideshare, before the very unfortunately titled Uber Conference VoIP teleconferencing software, UberConf came to be. And to give you an idea of what deeper and bigger and more means, there's this year I think there's 161 sessions. There's about 50 full day and half day hands-on workshops. All of the sessions uh, go into great depth over 90 minutes, not 30 minutes, not 45 minutes, but really give you enough time to dive deep. Uh, the speakers there are absolutely world class and I guarantee you if you go anywhere in the world to a tech conference. The headline speakers, are they're all going to be here, and almost all of them are No Fluff alumni. Matt, we were just in India on the other side of the world. Uh, who were their headline speakers? Scott Davis, Venkat, uh, Brian Sletton, 
Mark Richards, Carducci, uh, you. It was. Uh, Pratik, Raju, like all of the all of the no fluff speakers. And there's there's something and there's a lot to be said about that because all of the no fluff speakers basically, you know, we travel the country and 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 evolve not, on, not only the content but our speaking skills and everything week after week after week after week. I've given probably close to 1,200 talks over the last several years uh, as a result of this. So, so you can't help but be really good after doing this or, you, or get better. Let me say that. I, I'm not going to say I'm good. I, I got better though. I actually found one of my old talks and just like, oh my goodness, that was bad. So UberConf every year, this is the 10th anniversary, uh, is here in Denver, Colorado at the West End Westminster. And, um, and like I said, you, there's all this in-depth content. There's a bunch of full day workshops. There's an there's a entire workshop day. And, um, and it's basically, um, they're, they're a, they, I think they bring in you know, one or two sponsors. Uh, just to come in and have a presence, but it's not a vendor party. It's all about the content. It's all about giving you the best experience that you can get. And this is why I like the No Fluff conferences, because it's not just this big vendor party. It's not to get everybody into a room so Oracle and Accenture and AWS and all these people can sell to you. It's, it's where you can come in and learn from experts who have hands-on experience. And uh, that really means a lot to me, where they don't take a two-hour break between every session so you can go and have networking time in the exhibitor hall. Uh, now, you lose out on some of the swag, but Jay always has really good swag, to be honest. Uh, so UberConf is hands down my favorite technology conference in the world of the year. Um, as an attendee, I love it. As a speaker, I love it. Uh, a lot of great stuff. And the question was, am I giving this talk there? Sorry, I get easily distracted. Here's our roster of speakers for No Fluff. And let's see, view, influential engineer, influential engineer, art of execution, five essential SQL skills every developer should know. Productivity for the hopelessly disorganized and value-driven development. I have a light schedule this year. This is nice. I did three times as many talks last year. Does the room sit more than two people? Uh, <laughs> I sh well, uh, for the sequel talk, I'm not sure. I think he's going to put that in the smallest room. But uh, no, that was bad because he put me in a huge room when there were two people. And it when did they sit? The front or the back? <laughs> well, we ended up kind of all powwowing around. Uh, this was my first time I ever had two people in a talk. And uh, so I tried to give my talk to two people. And it's just, it's really weird. And, um, you know and they move the rooms around. So the, if you only get two people, you're probably going to get moved. I'm probably going to get moved, yeah. And Vencat will get the big space. <laughs> but uh, well, it turned into a 90-minute consulting uh, session. So they're like, well, here, let me, let, me, let me pull up the database. I'm like, I don't know if you should do that. Here you go. Well, because knowing UberConf, nobody there uses SQL. Hey, well, <laughs> I, I got nothing. But uh, the other, t so now, now if I ever get more than, or like few, just two or fewer people in a session, I always table a motion. I say, I'm going to table a motion, then we move the session to the bar. <laughs> Do I have a second? All in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries.